So this is the final session of the afternoon, and um, we're taking a slightly different tack. I, on the whole, I hope this is going to be a more optimistic <laughs> session <laughs> than the, uh, the earlier ones. Um, although, you know, there, there are some tough questions even here, but on the whole, uh, upbeat. Um, and the plan for the session is that I'm going to invite each of the speakers up to give their presentation and then they will go back and sit so they can see other people's slides. When they've all done, we'll bring them all up here and we're going to then have a little bit of structured conversation. I have some questions to pose to the, to the speakers and then we will open up for questions from the audience. And um, I wanted to start by making some remarks about this session. Um, we called it the Innovation Agenda. We played with words here. We thought about calling it Innovation Culture in Japan. Um, and I think you'll see why as we go along. But in fact, when I first proposed the idea for this panel, um, we had between us as organizers some discussion about whether this was really a good topic for the update. And um, some of my co-organizers initially were worried that this was just really um, one of those words that is bandied around but didn't have much meaning. So it's kind of become a convenient label for um, some political posturing without much substance. Uh, both of our countries, Australia and Japan, have policy documents and statements about national innovation agendas. But those documents are often discursive, um, they can ramble a bit, they can sometimes uh, be used to allow governments to claim credit for initiatives that the private sector is doing anyway and you know, thereby make themselves look as if they're on trend and in control when really it's something else happening altogether. Um, and then at the same time, the governments turn around and criticise industry and universities for not doing enough in this space and we all get a bit tired of the conversation generally. So we did sort of ask ourselves, all right, what, what's the real issue here? Is there something that we want to be talking about as academics and as practitioners? So um, we did come to the view that there is an important question here. And as you've heard from Sekine-san and in the opening remarks from Shiro, both countries face uh, a current and future productivity challenge. We both have to address how to raise growth, how to improve economic pros prosperity. And the challenge is, I think, at least twofold. One is simply to get back to where we were before the global financial crisis, when productivity performance, although it has been slowing since its peak period in the golden age of the 1960s and 1970s, it was still at that time better than it is now. Uh, and then the other challenge is how to move forward into the fourth industrial revolution and not to be left behind in an era of artificial intelligence, the internet of things and big data. What do those things mean for our economies and are we poised to respond to those challenges? So we put together a panel with diverse backgrounds to think about these questions from different points of view. So we have on the panel a perspective from economics, we have educators in entrepreneurship and in the public understanding of science, and we have a distinguished engineer who has himself had a long career of collaboration with Japanese scientists. And um, I want to introduce the speakers. You have their bios in front of you, but just to um, remind you, we have Professor Reiko Aoki, who is Commissioner at the Fair Trade Commission, and was before that an academic economist and a university executive administrator. And um, her research interests include innovation, product differentiation, and the law and economics of intellectual property. So she has a unique perspective now as a policymaker or as a regulator in the competition space with that background to bring that perspective to the question. Uh, Josh Flannery 
is um, from the University of New South Wales and has an interesting role in which he is um, working in the Division of Enterprise there and has his own startup business or program which uh, in through which he is training entrepreneurs and if you think that you can't train entrepreneurs and that they are somehow born rather than bred then I think you will be interested to see what Josh has to say but he also has a very long connection of working with Japan and understands the entrepreneurship culture in Japan and will help to help us to understand what where entrepreneurship comes from in Japan and how it differs from Australia. Uh, we also have um, Graham Durant, who is the director of Questacon. And any of you who live in Canberra, and indeed all the Australians in the audience, I hope, know about Questacon, and many of the Japanese in the audience will also know about Questacon. Graham will tell you more about that. Um, but he um, is uh, the um, director there and Questacon's mission is of course partly around science education. Um, he originally trained as a geologist at the University of Wales and spent time in Glasgow before he came to Australia so he has a distinguished career as a researcher as well. Um, and then we have uh, Brian Anderson, Professor Brian Anderson from the ANU who is momentarily got the wrong page here, sorry, um, who's an emeritus professor in the Research School of Engineering here at the ANU and is currently collaborating on a project with Japanese scholars on the operation of formations of drones. And I'm not sure that he has planned to tell us much about that project in his presentation, but I'm sure somebody will ask him about it because it's fascinating. Um, professor Anderson, uh, it joined the ANU in 1981 as its first engineering professor and has been um, in many senior positions in the university, but he has also held positions in a number of other universities and has been recognised by both the Australian and the Japanese governments with um, awards recognising his contribution to both countries. So that's who is going to speak, and I'm going to say a little bit about some questions that I posed to the panel when they when I was asking them to think about uh, the topic. So I've asked them to think about some things that puzzle me about Japanese innovation. And um, those questions were that I think we, when we think of Japan and innovation, we think of a number of apparently conflicting impressions. So we all think of Japan as having given the world many important innovations. We think of it as being a place that invents things, brings them to market, develops fabulous computers and uh, consumer products, all kinds of interesting gadgets that we all like to use. It ranks very highly in most indexes of innovation. There are a number of global indexes that try to rank countries by their innovativeness. And Japan always ranks highly in those. But it is also seen as a country that is not entrepreneurial, where people are not willing to take risks. People and, and companies particularly are not willing to take risks. We've heard in the course of the day the observation that it's hard to, to start companies up um, and that there are not there isn't that enthusiasm for, for having a go, making a startup, doing what it takes to get the small and medium enterprise sector really roaring ahead with productive new developments. In, uh, in academic terms, Japan has a very large number of researchers. It has a very high share of global publications in academic um, output terms, although its share in the world is dropping as China grows in size, it, the number of Nobel Prizes coming from Japan has increased very rapidly actually. In the last 10 years the number of Nobel Prizes has been much higher than in, in um, the previous 10 year period. So we have a kind of puzzle here. Is this a dynamic, innovative, inventive 
kind of society and economy? Or is it one in which uh, there is no appetite to take risks, to invent, to go out on a limb and try and do something new? And I would like to see if we can unpack some of the cultural, regulatory, political factors that influence the, the activity in both directions, influence the outcomes in both directions. And I want us also to ask some questions about whether doing science in Japan and doing academic um, discovery and research is different. Is there a different culture of scientific inquiry in Japan? Is that, does that lie at the heart of some of these puzzles? So I'm going to leave my introduction there and begin by inviting Reiko Aoki to come and speak on her subject. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction, and I, I also would like to thank uh, Jenny for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel, and also for the uh, update, the whole uh, um, event. It's been a, it's been an honor to uh, meet people like uh, Professor Drysdale that I've heard about, but I've never had the opportunity to meet, and it, everything has been a very intriguing and uh, stimulating uh, learning experience for me. And I hope I can contribute something uh, to the discussion about innovation through my um, expertise. I should say, although now I work for the Japan Fair Trade Commission, I'm here as an economist mostly and someone who's dabbled a bit in uh, economics of uh, innovation. Uh, so I'll, what I'll do is uh, start by uh, answering the four questions that were uh, posed by uh, Jenny, for starters, and they're there. So the first question, how do policy and regulation on competitive industry behavior by firms affect their performance? And this is a very good question. We have people esconded to the JFTC from METI, for instance, but they're very skeptical about co how competition could hinder uh, innovation, but that's not true because this is a relationship between competition policy and innovation. First of all, competition is, a ne is necessary for innovation. F first of all, firms with market power, i.e. like a monopolist in the product market, lack incentive to innovate compared to competitive firms. Because they have so much to profit to begin with, why should they bother innovating? Whereas if you're an incumbent, and I'm not sorry, if you're an outsider, you have no profits. So getting into the market with a new product and early in monopolizing the market is a very, very attractive proposition. Uh, who, that is, who is more hungry, incumbent or a startup? And the, um, am I talking too loud? Oh. <laughs> Which often happens. Um, this effect that monopolists have less incentive is called the replacement effect, because for monopolists it's just replacing a monopoly profit. Uh, there's also another side to the competition, and that's the competition in technology itself. So instead of the product market, you think of the technology market, and competition in technology market itself is very important before they come into the pro uh, product market. So competition for a new drug among par pharmaceutical companies, for instance, is very important. All the competition takes place before the product reaches the, the market. Second question, uh, how does that affect their willingness to innovate? Uh, I hope I convinced you with the previous slide that the answer is uh, yes, it does affect their willingness to innovate. And the next question, does it affect the ease of entry for new firms? Uh, this is where the, what the JFT, the Fair Trade Commission, which is like the ACCC in Australia does. It works, it has three pillars for, um, that, for implementing the anti-monopoly uh, policy. And first is the private, uh, watching out for private monopolization and un unreasonable restraint of trade. 
And this refers to the explanation it's given to you there in, in the orange uh, box. Uh, I don't know how many of you are. Can I highlight this? Thank you. Oh, I get it. So I think some of you would be familiar with. Oh. Some of the uh, terms here uh, for private things like cartels, price fixing, uh, bid rigging would be things that the, uh, uh, the anti uh, competitive uh, authority would be concerned about that can hinder competition. Second pillar is unfair trade practices, and this would include things like resale price maintenance, uh, trading on exclusive terms. Uh, restricting where a, a subcontract, uh, sorry, a franchisee, for instance, is able to sell geographic restrictions or whether you can sell on the internet versus the uh, brick and mortar store. Those would be vertical restraints. Uh, the third would be major merger regulation, uh, preventing uh, monopolization of the market. And like A triple C, JFTC or use. Uh, permission that firms can merge or not. Uh, so does it affect the ease of entry for new firms? Uh, yes, through monopoly. You saw the three pillars by which the JFTC guarantees uh, ease of entry for new firms. And the last question, how is this policy changing? And this, I'd like to introduce recent cases that the JFTC has been involved in, and also what the government has done. Government has, uh, has basic um, science, technology, innovation policy every five years. The fifth plan was introduced uh, last year. Uh, and so if you can check, the ba if you check the basic plans, there are many, many more. But what I'd like to focus on the, is on the National Strategic Special uh, special zones. But before I go into that, I'll uh, in briefly go over the antitrust informants cases that's related to the introduction of new technologies. The Blu-ray disc patent licensing uh, practice uh, came into question. I should have written this as one blue. If you go to the GFTC site, you can search for cases uh, and the rulings and there, there's a version in English also, you need to search for one blue, which is the actual name of the patent pool uh, that uh, implements uh, uh, the uh, Blu-ray uh, technology. Uh, they were, uh, we suspected um, unreasonable restraint, vertical restraint, uh, but the people who were restrained, restrained uh, went out of business, unfortunately, before we could make a ruling. They didn't go out of business. They decided to uh, get out of Blu-ray Blu risk. But our thoughts, how we JFTC thought about the case, can be quite uh, illuminating. Exclusionary behavior of agricultural co-ops. I'm sure people are familiar with the agricultural co-ops in, in Japan. There's a national push to change their behavior in terms of introducing new products. Innovation on markets, for instance, is hindered by how they expect exclusionary practices of the, the co-op. So, uh, in fact, we just get uh, ruled a cease and desist order uh, last month that over uh, eggplants that the co-op is now has taken it to court, take us, taken us to court uh, over the cease and desist order. So that you'll be hearing uh, more about. Uh, we're trying to improve the leniency programs, which has been very effective for uh, finding cartels and bed rigging. And related to AI and uh, big data, we, JFTC just released a, a report study uh, after a, a long, a year long research by a committee that included uh, economists, legal scholars, and practitioners, people in business, over what competition policy can do about data and the uh, effect that big data is having on, on the market. And I'm sure you're aware it's been a big issue in Europe, in, uh, in the United States also. In Japan, there has not been a case 
uh, over big data. And our belief is it's a very new frontier that we have to be very careful about. But there are already many, many tools in uh, anti-monopoly law and uh, rulings that we could use to uh, go after the uh, monopolization by uh, people who own big data. And the national strategic special zones are, this also I'm sure many of you know, there are over 200 of them now. And these are used for many, uh, many uh, goals. But one of them is when you want to introduce a new technology, you can't wait for the laws to change, particularly if it's things like pharma medical, medical devices or uh, new, uh, new experimental, uh, experimental test stations for uh, digital, not digital, for radio waves, for instance. You have to change a whole law in order to introduce a technology, and you can't wait around for that. So the government has, has uh, made use of these national, national strategic special zones so that they can actually use new technology without changing the law or having them go through the hoops of uh, licensing or uh, getting approval. And these have, I think, been quite uh, uh, successful. We've, in the morning, there was talk about the different forms of um, uh, transport, of carbon, carbon reducing transportation. Uh, that all new uh, technology, many of the new technology in that uh, field come into this role law about area management. So you have small cities like Toyota, for instance, that's a special zone and they try out new cars in, that, in those zones that would not be allowed in uh, public uh, highways. So to answer one of the questions that Jenny posed at the very beginning of the session, are Japanese willing, uh, Japanese are willing to take risks. So the Japanese way of taking risk, I think, is to have the government implement things like national strategic special zones. So the risk of new technology will be relatively uh, small. And I'll end my uh, presentation here. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks very much, Jenny, and uh, thanks, Reiko, for that wonderful intro to our session. Um, so uh, I, I think before I get started, um, one of my fears was being uh, put into the, the innovation session was that it would be the, the eyes rolling and the, the buzzwords and, and all of that, uh, the thing we're sort of sick of in, in the government rhetoric around innovation. So I, I felt like I almost need to have a, a glossary of terms and, and what they actually mean before we get started, or at least in the context of my presentation. So I think um, for, for my presentation, it's, it's quite important to differentiate between innovation and entrepreneurship. I think uh, they're sometimes used interchangeably. Uh, of, of course, they cross over. Um, and, and in a way, you could argue one enables the other. Uh, for, for the context of, of where I'm coming from with this talk, um, I'm very much more focused on the entrepreneurship side um, rather than, uh, I, I suppose, the whole other um, uh, challenge of STEM and, and the sort of uh, innovation learn, uh, around inventions and, and patents and commercialization of lab work. And instead, I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit more on uh, what you could say that the soft skills are, that uh, I believe there's, there's a, a gap in, in the sort of uh, learning and development of our, our students um, and, and even professionals um, globally, but, uh, but uh, specifically to, to, uh, to Japan and, and Australia too. Um, and another... Uh, part to give context to this talk is uh, the actual work that I do to give you some context of where I'm coming from. 
uh, in, in a university sense. So I work for something called the Division of Enterprise, uh, beam me up Scotty and all those Star Trek jokes, but it's, um, it's uh, really an initiative outside of anything to do with academic credit or, or research. It's uh, a, a, a nice clean analogy might be if you look at a careers and employment office that provides a service to students and graduates for employment opportunities. This is something parallel, but for people who want to make their own employment uh, via entrepreneurship and starting up companies and businesses. Um, so uh, my work is very much at the cold face of uh, working with uh, entrepreneurs um, and, and, and uh, those who are, are trying to create some sort of career path or the beginnings of a career path, uh, taking a, an entrepreneur route. Um, I also want to talk about uh, the concept of, of deep talent. So um, if you follow a, a lot of the, uh, the financial review uh, articles around innovation and where, where Australia needs to go, a lot of the focus is on deep technology. And, and that's obviously important and that we've obviously uh, had both in Japan and Australia some uh, tremendous success stories with obvious impact and I think that part's easier to understand um, but I, I think uh, where our, our countries are a little bit weaker is, is really developing a pipeline of deep talent that are inclined to take a risk and take an, an entrepreneurial uh, career path or at least um, attempt one and, and leverage the learnings uh, along the way for whatever career they end up in. Okay. So um, there are obviously many challenges uh, for entrepreneurship anywhere. Um, a, a lot of uh, the, the uh, phrases I've put there have actually been uh, explored in, in other talks today, but I, I didn't want to go into uh, too much uh, de depth or analysis of, of you know, policies or restrictions around uh, particular details with company structures um, fr from one country to another and, and how changing something slightly might might create an impact because I think anything in that area is incremental, slow, and cannot be acted upon immediately. Um, but I, I think I would like uh, to look more on the urgency of the situation um, in terms of the future of the, the global workforce and, and where the workforce is going and where uh, our education system and uh, the way uh, startup and small business owners um, need to go if they're going to be relevant, um, you know, even tomorrow. So um, if we look at uh, the S&P index, which is a, a US-based uh, index that tracks where uh, the, the, the top 500 companies are going in terms of how long they're, they're actually lasting as organizations. Uh, back in 1965, the average lifespan of, a, of an organization, we're talking about large businesses, was 33 years. Um, if you uh, fast forward to 1990, it already uh, got clipped down to um, 20 years. And it's projected that in 2028, as soon as 2028, the average lifespan of a large business, we're not even talking about startups, is going to be 14 years. So what, what does that say? That, that says that if you are not prepared to work in an entrepreneurial company, there aren't going to be many options for you regardless of industry, regardless of sector, regardless of the type of work you do. Your organisation is going to become entrepreneurial. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone has to be a startup company founder. It doesn't mean that um, you, you have to uh, go and have a huge appetite for risk. But what it does mean is that at some point in the near future, 
you are going to be either starting an entrepreneurial company, working for an entrepreneurial company, or providing a service to an entrepreneurial company. And I think uh, with that as, as a backdrop, um, it, it gives us uh, a, a little bit of a kick in the pants in terms of how important this element of education and training is alongside the focus of STEM and, and arts and creativity and, and other things, the sort of soft skills around enterprise and how to do business, how to do design thinking are as if not more important. That, that's, my, that's what I put to you today. So uh, in terms of Japan, um, it, it actually is quite interesting how similar uh, both in timing and theme, the, the Abe and Turnbull um, initiatives at the government level were uh, for supporting entrepreneurship. Um, as, was, as has been mentioned, and I won't go too far into the policies themselves, but there's basically um, initiatives to support entrepreneurship startups, small businesses, um, and there are, uh, you know, relatively um, favorable conditions in policy. Uh, there are grants, there are funds. Um, if, you, if you take, for example, uh, the, the MEXT uh, initiative, uh, they have something called the EDGE program. Now this is, uh, some of you may, may know, I know there's uh, someone from Kyushu uh, Daigaku here, and they're a part of that program. So that program is a, essentially came from a pool of government funding and a, a selection of universities are given that to spend on entrepreneurship training. Um, and uh, Kyushu, for, uh, Kyushu is one that is uh, looking into medical innovation uh, programs and we're actually um, in talks uh, about a, a form of exchange program where instead of applying as a student looking for an exchange experience, you are students circumstantially, but you apply as a startup company and your application process is more to do with why does it make sense for your Fukuoka-based startup idea to come and, and test the market in Australia and vice versa. So we're looking at things like that. But some really interesting, exciting things are happening, but it is anecdotal still. Um, and in fact, I, I don't think that's a huge concern because uh, the, if you go back to uh, the comment made uh, by Sekine-san from the, um, the Bank of Japan today, uh, it was basically the observation that um, not everyone uh, is, is going to become an entrepreneur or should. And I think that's always been the case and that's actually been the case in Silicon Valley. So, entrepreneurship and startups happen around the edges um, and and I think it, it'll always be be that case but uh, it's it's now a matter of working together with startups and know-how around um, facilitating partnerships with startups as larger companies that that uh, we need to hurry up and get up to speed on um, so look, looking at uh, corporate, so um, th there's sort of uh, different ways um, the Japanese corporates are being involved in the innovation and startup ecosystem. Uh, some of the obvious high, um, uh, high profile ones are the likes of Rakuten and, uh, and SoftBank. And so uh, whether they're being a, a sort of entrepreneurial and, and global sort of aggressive company like Rakuten or whether they're actually starting up their own fund like, like a soft bank. Um, they're, they're definitely uh, key players globally now uh, but again they're, they're few and far between and, and hopefully they are inspirations to the next, the next generation that this is a, a legitimate path and it doesn't have to be seen as um, something that it, uh, it turns you into the black sheep of, of the family. Um, the, there are other models now that are being explored by corporates. Um, 
there's been a, a corporate venture model uh, that, that's been around for a while now, uh, for the likes of KDDI, uh, where they will uh, invest strategically in, in startups that are aligned with their businesses as a way of uh, diversifying their offerings. Um, but uh, the, there's also um, a more recent model, and, and this is where um, I think the real opportunity for some cross-border, uh, in, in particular, with thinking about Australia and Japan lie, and that is um, in a, a what, what I'll call a corporate accelerator program model. So um, for those of you who uh, have, have been in or around the, the startup ecosystem in Australia, there's a group called Slingshot. And, the, and their basic model is they will partner with a corporate, whether it be uh, HCF or uh, NRMA, and they will set up a startup accelerator program that is backed by said corporate and uh, they will provide some funding to startups that apply on a competitive basis to be accelerated through a three-month program. And the idea is that they're actually building companies to invest further in at the other end of the three months or to acquire for strategic uh, M&A. And th there has been um, of late a, a, a recent example of this model popping up in Japan. So there's a group called CREW, uh, C-R-E-W-W, -W, and uh, they've basically been uh, doing this similar kind of model with the likes of Panasonic, with the likes of um, even government organisations, um, the, the Hankyu group, um, and uh, another, another one that comes to mind that's quite interesting is uh, Tokyo Rail. So you could imagine from the corporate side, they're looking for ways to keep up with disruptive, sorry, I said disruptive, I was trying not to say disruption, <laughs> uh, with, with, with startups that are, are taking their market share. Um, and, um, and, and the way they're doing that is literally uh, starting, managing, running a program, investing in the teams as they develop, and probably having a say in how that those companies stay aligned with their core business as the investors. And that seems to be an area of growth and, um, and, and something to possibly explore between Australia and Japan, seeing as the model is uh, showing some early signs of success in both, both countries. Um, looking at uh, the, the startup ecosystem, um, I spoke about the EDGE program with universities. Um, there's also, um, well, Japan has a much longer history of having uh, venture capital and, and actually startup support programs than does Australia. In fact, uh, there's close to 100 uh, venture capital funds in, in Japan that have been invested, investing in startups. Um, the key issue with the ecosystem at the startup level for Japan is most of the startups are domestic facing um, and the biggest challenge with that is it's not it's not translating to bigger markets um, and it turns into the same old scenario where you're trying to wrap a layer of localization and and, and translation and, and language services around a product that isn't really being built for another, a market other than Japan um, and, and uh, to be fair, uh, Australia ha has, has a similar problem. So um, that is causing uh, a bit of an opportunity for foreign players to come in to the Japanese ecosystem. Um, some of the notable ones being a group called 500 Startups. So that's um, one of the big Silicon Valley uh, venture capital firms and they have an accelerator program. And they've set up, uh, actually, interestingly, in partnership with Kobe City Government. Um, and basically, they're looking to create startups with capability in both Japan and Western markets. And they are um, they're, they're, uh, interestingly, seem to have caused a bit of a ripple effect in the Kansai region. Um, soon after uh, the, the 500 Startup Initiative was announced, um, Osaka city government came out with 
uh, what's known as the Osaka Innovation Hub. Um, and the Osaka Innovation Hub itself is a very large co-working space that tries to bring together local entrepreneurs, uh, in fact, from all Kansai wide, with the corporates that are interested in innovation. Um, but the, the interesting move they've made is um, most of their events are in English. So you, you can actually walk in and uh, it does have somewhat of a, um, a Singapore or Hong Kong co-working space feel in that you can hear many different accents, but usually they're using English. Um, so that, that to me uh, is, is a sign of hope. Um, Um, so, and, and I think um, it, it also plays to where, where the opportunities are for uh, the Japanese startup, startup ecosystem to further develop. Um, for me, it's very much around um, developing the talent pool. Um, and I think it would be difficult to separate um, a, a global approach with an entrepreneurial approach in the context of the Japanese market. Um, de demographics aren't very good if you're just going to be an inwardly facing company now. So in, in the same way that Australian startups have this rhetoric, they keep being uh, told that you have to be global from day one. Um, I, I think that's very similar to the approach that some of the newer, uh, more internationally inclined incubators are taking. Um, so what does that actually mean? So what, what does global from day one mean and, and uh, does it even make sense for, for early stage companies? Um, and, and to answer that, um, I'm going to segue into um, the program I run with my other hat. So uh, I, I started last year with two co-founders um, in, in Sydney, both Japanese nationals who are, are residents of Sydney. Um, a program called Innovation Dojo. And the basic premise is back to that core um, deep talent need in, in terms of uh, starting a startup with a true and natural global capability. So in this case, we focused on the vertical of Japan and Australia. Um, we often get asked why Japan and why Australia, why not the US and China, if, if you're talking about entrepreneurship. But really, we weren't uh, looking for what the biggest and, and, and sexiest markets were. It was more about how do we tackle the problem of these great trading partners having a long-standing relationship that we love talking about, but in a way, in a sense, it could be interpreted as just being waiting to be uh, cannibalized by, by other more aggressive um, and, and, and more cashed up countries that are looking at the same problems. So what if we looked at areas like agriculture um, and, and ag, ag, ag tech? And, and what if we looked at the aging population and solutions around health that both countries are, are, have real pay, pain points around? And instead of um, scouring the labs for um, solutions that may or may not be the right one, why don't we create companies with um, all the elements that Silicon Valley tells us we need in a startup? So that the old uh, hipster, hacker, hustler. So you need someone with design skills, you need someone with engineering or science behind product development, and you need someone with business skills. But let's add a fourth element and make that the, the sort of Asia literacy that was asked in a, a question earlier. And so what we're doing with Innovation Dojo is we are making a competitive application process for would-be entrepreneurs and you either have to fit one of those categories and we're actually designing teams so that they have all the elements that a potential successful startup would have, including bilingual capability. So of the, the seven uh, companies that were created through our first cohort, all of them had a Japanese English speaker, at least one, in their team. And um, it was a very interesting experiment for us. So um, you can actually see uh, in, in that 
image there, V Kaiwa. So uh, that's a play on VR, virtual reality, and uh, Kaiwa, A Kaiwa. So they're, they're using um, virtual reality to train uh, language students. Um, and, and that's a very interesting uh, team. So they, we actually found um, some Australian born Japanese uh, who, who were interested in, in participating. And uh, we found a, a Chinese national who'd migrated, but her Japanese was better than the, uh, the, the guy with Japanese parents because she, she was a, a Japanese language major and, a, and another developer joined their team. And they, in the, in the period of, of a month, not only um, created a virtual reality platform for learning languages, but they actually taught themselves how to code VR. They had not done that before. So the depth of talent is quite amazing. Um, and uh, that, that is sort of our poster child company at the moment, um, because they're actually making money from, from what they're doing. Um, we took them over to uh, Japan in April um, and little did they know they would be pitching in Japanese in front of large groups of uh, salarymen uh, um, and, and it was um, you know, obviously a uh, character and, and skill building um, experience for the team. But what was um, quite exciting for us was the reaction from the, the Japanese side where they were seeing something that they would never have predicted and that is Australian first-time entrepreneurs pitching in Japan in Japanese. And to them that was very exciting. And, and I think that's, that's a potential model to um, invest more in. Um, there have been... Um, some some recent movement um, in, from the the Australian tech scene into Japan and vice versa. I've I've only got about two minutes left, so I'll just talk about Money Tree. So uh, Money Tree is a, a very interesting case study, and it sort of talks to what um, I, I'm I'm trying to do with Innovation Dojo. Um, so uh, a young Australian named Paul Chapman. Um, and, and a mate of his who were majors, I believe, at University of Sydney in their Japanese language program. They um, took off to Japan and, and had an idea to start a business around uh, financial technology. So they created a mobile application that helps educate um, people on making investment decisions. Um, and little did they uh, know at the time that they would end up being invested in by uh, two of the major banks in, in Japan and uh, raising uh, up to Series B now in investments. And the, the coolest part for me of the, their story is only now are they trying to enter the Australian market. So, so they're, they're actually using Austrade for advice on entering the Australian market as Australian entrepreneurs who have had their first success in Japan. So um, I, I think that maybe that, that part is, is a strange uh, series of events, but the, the core, I think, of, of, of that case goes back to the deep talent. So um, let's try and work together and create a pipeline of Asia literate, entrepreneurial, bright people in both countries and let's tackle the big problems that we have because there are a lot of problems we can work together on and perhaps that model can then flow through to the way we approach politics and potential wars and things like that. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Konnichiwa, good afternoon and uh, welcome and thank you very much for this opportunity to present and Josh, what a great presentation and uh, I think there are a few ideas I have where we might be able to work together there, so um, good. So let me get ready. So um, Jenny talked about, well I think it was political, political posturing with no substance when we talk about innovation, so 
perhaps that's why I'm here. Um, but actually, Questacon, we're engaged in science, science and society, science communication, because as we move forward, it's really important that science serves society. And for all the great research and innovation to happen, you have to bring the public along on the journey with you, because that's the big challenge. We're moving into an area where the world is filled with anti-science, pseudo-science, and we need a smart population that can discriminate between science, non-science, and nonsense. We need to think about human capacity development, starting with the very young. And in Questacon, we start with the very young. The young children who are in Questacon this morning have every chance of welcoming in the 22nd century. So just think about that. What world are they going to be growing up in as they go through school, university, work, into the future? That's going to be a, such a profound change for them. So human capacity development, preparing for the future, preparing for the future of work. These planetary scale challenges, we have to generate a solutions generation. So that's our core business at Questacon. And um, I want to very quickly reflect on the history of Questacon and then use that as a jumping off point to look at uh, perhaps some new directions that we can move into. So the Australian government in 19... 84 reached out to the Japanese government to ask for help in building a science centre here in Canberra. And the Japanese government decided that they would get involved, set up a, a committee, the Australian National 200 Years Commemoration Forum, with representatives from, representatives from business, academics and government, under the chairmanship of Ashiro Saito, who was the chairman of Nippon Steel Corporation and to become the president of uh, Kadendran. And in 1986, that forum reported to Foreign Minister Shintaro Abe, father of the current Prime Minister, and they decided, because of the close, friendly relationship between Japan and Australia, the strengthening of that relationship is very important, and that the forum recommended that the Japanese government and citizens fund half the cost of building the National Science Centre, Questacon. Now, Questacon is a hands-on science centre. It works here in Canberra, across Australia, internationally. It's been doing it since 1988 when it opened. It works with teachers involved in science communication training. It helps build capacity in science centres around Asia and into Africa. It generates about $60 million a year for the ACT tourism economy. And everything that Questacon does and has done goes right back to that founding gift from Japan and the Japanese business community that helped encourage the Australian government to get over the line and build the centre. So thank you very much for that on behalf of all the Australian people and people in Africa and Asia who have benefited from some of our work. So the relationship between Questacon and Japan and Japanese institutions is very strong, broad and deep. And we've had many examples of how that can be reflected over the years and we regularly celebrate our successes together and uh, our friendships. And we have a lot of partnership activities, particularly in the area of science communication training. So we work very closely with the National, the Muse National Museum of Nature and Science in Ueno, or particularly with MRICAN, where we have these strong relationships. The organisations, JAXA, JAMSTEC, we've exhibited their work in Canberra, and we've done a number of other things. And we keep on <coughs> celebrating that relationship in many ways. So Mrs. Abe came to visit us as part of our 25th anniversary celebrations. We had the Kaidandran hosted, we hosted a dinner at Questacon for them. And we have this ongoing friendship with Marika, and we were able to help celebrate their 10th anniversary um, not in 2011. And we've helped deliver a whole series of visitors to Maraikan and other institutions, including our Prime Minister. Um, and Professor Brian Schmidt will be going there in October. We managed to organise a visit for him on October 13th. So, okay. um, our Science Circus is our mobile pop-up science centre. We can tour around Australia and set up 50 hands-on exhibits in about two hours students from the Australian National University run that 
uh, around Australia. They do science shows in shoots, schools. They do a, a public exhibition, which they, they operate. And that model, which has been operating for 30 years in Australia, we were able to take it to Japan as part of our 25th anniversary celebration. But we went through to the, uh, with the help of the Australia Japan Foundation, so thank you very much for that support. We were able to go to the tsunami recovery areas of northeast Honshu, and particularly Minami Sanriku, where Australia has a, a strong presence. And we work very closely with the science communicators in five different organisations in five different cities, and it was fantastic learning together. Um, we learned so much, and uh, I hope. Uh, Japanese colleagues uh, likewise did, and I know MEXT were very grateful, and Mirai Kan were uh, given a special award because of this program. And I'm really delighted to be able to report that, and it's perhaps not been announced yet, so perhaps I shouldn't say that, but uh, with the help of the Australia Japan Foundation, we'll be going back to the Osaka region in 2018 as part of the celebrations of the focus year for public diplomacy between Australia and Japan. And we're hoping to build the program and introduce some more entrepreneurial uh, enterprise activities. And hearing about your uh, group in Osaka you know, really just gets my juices going. And I think there's some tremendous opportunities there where we can work together. Um, Questacon and Miraicam are part of a world community of science centres. It's a fantastic community. We work in all sorts of different countries and across all sorts of borders, whether they're geographic, racial, religious, political, economic. And we're all gathering together in Tokyo in November this year. I've had the pleasure of serving on the International Planning Committee for that conference. And it has the focus of connecting the world for a sustainable future. And we've not talked a lot about sustainability today. We've talked a lot about innovation, enterprise, business, research. But Japan is also a, a leader in sustainability, and it should you know, be acknowledged that you know, this is a strong focus, and you know, the science, and te science, Technology and Society Forum each year has always had that strong focus on what they call the light and dark of science. But we need to work together to find those planetary solutions. So when science centres get together, we can... Uh, collectively, we reach about 350 million young people each year. We can do an awful lot together. One of the things I'll be speaking about when I'm in Tokyo is an Australian uh, product developed in partnership with the Crawford School here at the ANU, Young Persons Plan for the Planet. One of the challenges young people have is that people don't listen to them. And yet the future is their future. So, you know, Talking to students in schools, they don't like being told you know, what their future is by old blokes like me. They want to design and develop their own future. So reaching into the schools, empowering them, connecting them, teaching them how to develop a business plan in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals has been a really powerful experience. We've run a 20 school pilot in Australia this year. I'm pleased that we'll be starting our international pilots next year, including international schools in Japan. In Australia, each school this year will partner with two new schools, so we'll go from 20 to 60, 60 to, well, I'll keep 180. Internationally, each country can bring their own young Japanese or young Mauritians or young Fijians plan for the planet together. And I reckon in five years, we'll have empowered young people right across the planet to write the first business plan to manage the planetary life support systems on Earth, because there isn't one at the moment. And you know, our political leaders and our business leaders don't seem capable of writing it, so let's get the youngsters to write it, so there we go. Um, so science centres, we work in an informal learning domain, alongside schools, but outside schools. We go inside schools as well, we help teachers, but. Um, our space is in that science and society space, public engagement with science. And it's really important because youngsters, school is important to develop foundation knowledge, but actually most of what kids learn is outside school. You know, Peer-to-peer know, -peer tutoring is the way most kids learn IT these days, and uh, that happens in bedrooms and you know, dining room tables around, around the world, I suspect. 
So Questacon runs a national science engagement program, Inspiring Australia, and I know there's been interest in Japan. I've talked to a number of officials about the Australian model, and this is perhaps something we can share a bit future. Um, we run a smart skills program, and, and that's again something that uh, I'm really interested to see emerging uh, through um, some of the initiatives in Japan. But you've got to start early. You've got to, you can actually start enterprise education in primary schools and build sequentially in the way that we identify young sporting talent very early and nurture it to win Olympic medals and 2020, whoever it is. Um, we should do the same with entrepreneurs and you know, we could, there are young kids who, you know, we've got an 11 year old company director here in Canberra, 11 year old. You know, you'd be amazed what young kids can do if they're given a chance and we need to uh, give them that chance. So the future STEM, in, again, this is where we're going into the future. This is the, um, I suppose, the, the new directions, where we need to be. Youngsters now need to be flexible. They need to develop not only the foundation knowledge, they need to develop smart skills, and they need to develop enterprise skills, because that's the future of work. That's the future for most of our young people in Australia, and I expect in Japan too. They need creativity, imagination. You know, they, they need to be able to work together, they need to network. They can find knowledge, they know how to do that, but they have to develop the wisdom. The enterprise skills are the really important things. And, and I was just going to wave this report. I don't know how many of you know the Foundation for Young Australians, but you should. And they do some really good work on behalf of young Australians. And they've produced a series of reports, and this one came out last month, uh, The New Basics. And there's about four reports about talk, talking about the future and the future of the world of work. And they're helping young people think into that future. And I, I, I commend their work to you. And uh, they're certainly behind this idea of developing the enterprise skills alongside the technical skills. And, They've got a lot of evidence in the reports uh, about to do that. Now, the bottom down here, I've put a single strike out through the ability to pass exams. I decided it wasn't worth a double strike out, because actually it's still very important. But it's not the only thing that you have to do. And we know that you know, Japan succeeds wonderfully well in PISA, you know, number four. But when you look at you know, there was a study, I think, it's 2012 now, so it's a bit historic. But out of 24 developed countries, Japan was the 24th in terms of enterprise and entrepreneurial skills. So, you know, that tells us that we need to do a bit more. And it's great that the Japanese government recognised that, changed the national curriculum, took out 30% of the content to allow students to focus on problem solving and some of those... Um, opportunities to use their knowledge in real world context. So really important and you know these things are moving forwards in, in both countries. So I'm going to stop at that point and uh, leave a little bit of time for questions. So thank you very much and thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and Jenny, thank you for giving me the privilege of attending today. It's been a real uh, eye-opener. Uh, although I've worked in um, universities for a long time and, of course, given many talks, this will be one of the least academic talks I've ever given because uh, I'm not going to talk to you about the results of a survey of 100 academics in Australia and 100 academics in Japan and how they got on collaborating uh, at Jenny's invitation, I'm going to talk about my personal experiences. So that's not terribly academic, I know. Uh, it's a small sample, I know. I did calibrate my thoughts with two colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they suggested very, very few changes, I, I, I should say. Uh, so to say a little bit about my background, because this will 
explain better where I'm coming from. Most of my uh, jobs have been as an engineering academic, but I have had experience with uh, companies and governments and professional societies. I had a year and a half uh, part-time with a company in um, Silicon Valley. Uh, I've been a company director in Australia for medical product companies and uh, actually Anutech here at the ANU. I was on the Science Council for three Prime Ministers in Australia. I've led a couple of professional societies. Um, I've been on technical advisory boards for companies, not just uh, in Australia. So in comparison with, say, a professor of mathematics, I've had a richer set of uh, life experiences. Uh, also, I'm in an area where uh, it's very, very typical to do uh, collaborative work. And I have to go back a few years to find a paper that I wrote by myself. It, it might even be 10 years, I don't know. So it's certainly more than 95% of what I write is collaborative. And probably 50% of what I write uh, has an author from outside of Australia. I've had an aggregate of years in each of the United States, China, Japan, and French and German speaking parts of continental Europe. A small amount of time in Korea and uh, South America and uh, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, so this is where I'm coming from. And my Japanese experiences do include multiple uh, collaborative visits to uh, Kyoto University and uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology. By collaborative visit, I mean it's, it's at least a week's, some week's duration and I expect to produce a paper out of the visit in distinction to a one-day visit where you give a, a talk. Uh, I did write one textbook with a Nagoya um, University professor and uh, there's the title of it, and it's also available in, in uh, English. And uh, I've done two papers with Japanese co-authors uh, this year, and I'll, I'll show you one of them uh, in a moment. Uh, my, my experiences with Japanese companies, though, are more limited. Uh, I went to Fujitsu a couple of times, uh, probably uh, mid-1980s, I think, and advanced a couple of research proposals and was unsuccessful, but it stimulated me to try to learn Japanese, which I've just done on a self-study basis. And of course, this is like climbing Mount Everest and I'm in about the, the bottom base camp, but at least I can read a bit of signage in the, in the stations and so on. Uh, another company that I've had a little bit to do with is one uh, started by a former student of mine, an Australian, who went to Japan in the mid-1980s on a Mombusho, a postdoctoral fellowship, and uh, married a Japanese girl, came back to Australia for several years, but then they went and settled in Japan. And he is genuinely uh, a bicultural sort of person. He has twins, one's called Megumi, and the other's called James. So there you see <laughs> the, the two cultures. And he is a patent broker where he approaches Japanese companies that have patents and he markets their intellectual property in the United States and, and also Japan because he's taught him, uh, also China because he's taught himself uh, Chinese. But really my uh, experiences with Japanese companies have been quite small. Uh, so here's one of the papers that I, I wrote with um, some Japanese people uh, quite recently. Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture on this stuff, but Professor Corbett suggested I say a little bit about it. Australia wants to defend its borders. It uses unmanned airborne vehicles as part of that. Some of these vehicles are two metre wingspan vehicles and they can fly for 24 hours. In order to triangulate transmissions from people smugglers or illegal fishermen, they generally fly in formation. So the task is to keep three vehicles, say, or even six in an equilateral triangle, if it's three vehicles with a side length of several kilometres. The vehicles are very primitive, so one's going at 80 knots, another's going at 79, and another's going at 81, and the wind's blowing them round. So how do you keep three vehicles in a triangular formation and 
they're slightly different speeds and they're being blown around by the wind and you don't want an army of people working very hard on the ground. That's, that's the engineering sort of challenge that this paper deals with. Uh, so now I want to give you my personal observations on uh, collaboration. I think there are cultural background issues that uh, affect the technical discussions uh, differently. And this is the way I characterise them. If you're an Australian and you've never been to Japan before and you go on your first visit, you'll think the Japanese are very hesitant to express a differing opinion. They might say, well, it's difficult to say, but they'll never say they disagree with you. Uh, on the other hand, I'm sure that from the Japanese side, Australians must seem very confronting at times when they take a, a different view to that expressed by the, by the Japanese. So there's a bit of a, a cultural difficulty there. I've also seen, and, and my students really point this out, and I've had several go to Japan, that junior Japanese people talking to their professor in Japan, or perhaps talking to me, are much more reserved than the Australian student talking to the Australian <coughs> professor. And really, progress in science and engineering does require a lot of dialogue and tossing round of ideas, and it is unfortunate if people feel restrained in putting a point of view. We're not talking about politics or religion or women or anything really difficult like that. It's just technical stuff which is kind of neutral uh, and yet there's still uh, some difficulty in uh, bringing uh, different opinions together. Uh, I suspect too, but it's only a suspicion that collaborating is easier for engineers than social scientists because Engineering rests on a scientific platform of largely mathematics and physics. Mathematics is effectively black and white in, in what it says. There is a theorem or there's not a theorem. And uh, so it's easier to be able to point to an authority that establishes that a certain point of view is right or wrong than I imagine to be the case in uh, social uh, sciences. Um, I, another observation I have is that, uh, to me, there's more hesitancy in Japan than Australia to pursue new technical directions. When I think of the technical, new technical directions and big advances and how they were kicked off in my particular discipline, the United States is, is number one, I believe, even if you discount for their size. If you, if you calculate it on the basis of new technical directions per 100 million of population or something, I think the US would easily, beat, uh, would easily beat Japan. Maybe the Japanese are fast followers, but there's a sort of conservatism that is maybe driving the selection of technical problems in Japan at the university uh, level. Uh, I think it's probably true that Japanese travel less outside of Japan to uh, collaborate. If I'm in the US, there's very often European visitors there. There's very often Chinese visitors. There's not very often uh, Japanese visitors. Of course, many of them do travel, but in terms of the degree of travel, I think it's much less. And it's very much less, I think, for Japanese students. Um, in uh, coming to the form formulation of a paper, what's often going on is that someone says something and then someone says, well, it's not quite like that, it's like this. There's a, there's a thesis and there's an antithesis and then together you form a synthesis. So I guess what I'm saying with a number of these remarks is that to me that process is trickier for an Australian in Japan uh, because probably of the, the, the culture that's engendered since, uh, since childhood, the, the culture that gives great respect to senior people and sets a great store by harmony 
in, uh, in discussions. So a second set of observations. I've been talking about culture. Another issue is language. And um, it's certainly the case that you can compare people, or I can compare people, in engineering schools in China, Korea, and Japan. And, and I'd, I'd, I've got a view about the students in the best schools. So in China, it might be Tsinghua University or Zhejiang University. I'm not talking about a lower grade university. And in Korea, Seoul National University or these two, KAIST and GIST, which are entirely English speaking in, in their complete programs. And in, J in Japan, like Kyoto University or uh, Todai, something like that. So for me, the Chinese are better than the Koreans and the Koreans are better than the Japanese. I think in Japan, it's probably more uniform across all the universities, whereas in China, there's a huge variation but if, between the best universities and the weaker ones. But if we're just looking at the best, this is the ordering I'd give on it. And um, that English level, or the comparative lack of facility in English, can, I think, reinforce the reticence of Japanese in the technical discussion that precedes the writing of the paper. Um, I think these days senior people in Japanese are normally fine in English. They've had lots of international experiences, at least at conferences, although it certainly wasn't the case 30 years ago. Um, and the mid-career people have a middle standard. Now, what it is in social science, I, I don't know. I'm sure there are disciplinary uh, differences. I do think that the staff and students are technically very well prepared. You can mention an idea and they know all about it. And that's a, a very nice situation when you're interacting uh, with them. Now, here's another issue. Um, engineering is considered a discipline in Australia where unfortunately there are only about 15% of the student body who are females. It's unfortunate because there's a great waste of talent. Um, I don't know what the fraction is in, in Japan, but I, I, it must be somewhat close to zero. And, and I have never, I can never recall meeting one female Japanese engineering professor. So, that's an even bigger talent waste, I would suggest to you, than, than we have uh, in Australia. Uh, it was very nice to see that one of our Japanese speakers today was a female professor, Professor Aoki, but that's, for me, uh, uh, an exception. So if I uh, wanted to sum up now, and this is my final slide, um, collaboration is slower for the cultural reasons and the language reasons. Uh, and that's my principal message. But my supplementary message, and I suppose you think of these things near the end of your career, it's been a privilege for me to have visited Japan so many times and, and made some wonderful uh, friends uh, there. It's been a, an enriching cultural uh, experience that I'd have paid vast sums to have, but I didn't have to, so I'm even luckier on, on, on that account. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Corbett again because I could get in this final statement of thanks. table here. And we have about 20 minutes. So while I was going to start by myself posing some questions to the speakers, I'm actually going to open up to questions from the floor right from the beginning. I will hold my own questions um, and until if we have a lull in the questions, I will leap in. But I'm going to open up first of all and we have the roving mic. So can we have some questions from the floor? Who would like to start? Microphone is on. Okay. We've lulled them into... We have, haven't we? It is 
is late in the afternoon. Well, while everybody is thinking of their questions, then, um, I will begin uh, with um, a couple of general questions that I wanted to pose. Um, one is something that Josh mentioned when he opened up about terminology and, and, uh, and definitions. And so my question is, um, do you think we need to define innovation? And if we are going to do it, do you, would we do it differently, do you think, in Japan, from the way we might do it in Australia? Or does this not matter? Is it a mistake to try and pin this down? Is this a concept that we sort of we sort of understand and we should just leave it flexible and open? So if, if I can have first go at that, I, I think we failed to define it in you know, the use in Australia. So I'm um, goodness knows how it would translate. So I, I think it's a term that's overused. Um, there was actually a time when I wear a hat as a divisional head in the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, I should have declared that. There was a time when we weren't allowed to use innovation. There was a change from one political party to another, and innovation was seen to be associated with one particular government and party. So we, we had to stop using it, literally, in, in the department. And for those of you who know the um, television series Utopia, it was a very utopian moment. Um, <laughs> So, anyway, we've now reintroduced innovation back into our lexicon, but uh, it is still poorly defined. Uh, Reiko, what word would you use in Japanese, and do you think it's helpful or not? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up, because there's no... Well, maybe my Japanese colleagues in the audience could uh, would say otherwise. There's really no word that means innovation in, in Japanese. And for that reason, when uh, they changed the name of the Science for Science and Technology Council for Science and Technology <coughs> Policy, they had to use the word innovation, not the Japanese. They say innovation, <laughs> not a Japanese equivalent, because there was no no equivalent term, and there's really no. And it's also noted that there's no agreement on what innovation means. One comment I would make as a social scientist is that in Japan, when you say innovation, it definitely means something with, to do with natural sciences and engineering. Although I think in English, for instance, you would say, you know, that a child used a, a toy in a very innovative way, meaning you, you did something different from the traditional way. And innovation in Japan doesn't uh, always uh, cover that kind of uh, meaning of innovation. So now uh, many people stress that innovation, <coughs> you can use the word innovation to mean social innovation as well, but it doesn't always have to be something about machines or chemical equations. That's very interesting because I looked up some definitions. I looked at the Oxford English Dictionary, but I also looked at uh, a recent report in Australia called the Performance Review of Australian Innovation and Science, which, uh, and the Science Research System, which has just come out from uh, the new body that uh, was established under the Innovation Agenda. And the, the wording that is used there is all about social systems and about economic processes and it's nothing at all to do with scientific discovery or invention. Um, so perhaps we have really a very different cultural kind of thought process that goes on when you use that word. Um, now, come on, questions from the floor. We can't, you can't all be asleep. Good, there we go. Right, so yeah, we'll start with Ipe and then Carol. So uh, I would like to ask the questions to Professor Anderson. I cannot agree to your contents in the presentation more. And uh, actually, many Japanese universities are now, now acknowledging that uh, you know, more international collaboration is necessary. And uh, I must still have a lot of international collaboration in my research. But uh, at the same time, university tries to take, take some top-down policy to facilitate the international collaboration. But, uh, 
According to my experiences, I think uh, international collaboration is mainly from the bottom up. Somehow the, I have a connection with the researcher or uh, maybe writing the paper with the classmates. So that I would like to know whether uh, uh, there is any, you know, maybe the useful top-down policy from the university to facilitate the uh, uh, international research collaboration. Uh, yes, I think uh, there is. Uh, I believe that you can't collaborate with someone unless you see them face to face at some point. Uh, it's very, very hard to do it otherwise with email or, or even Skype. Um, so you need to create opportunities to bring people face to face. Now, the graduate students in the ANU can get a vice chancellor's grant. It's probably got some fancy name and maybe Jenny invented it, I don't know. But they can get a vice chancellor's grant to go to a conference. And the supervisor may say, who are you going to target? Here's how you should talk to this person. And that, that can be the, 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 and the, that's the basis for the students. I think there's funds for probably postdocs and the Academy of Science and the Academy of Tech Sciences and Engineering have <coughs> travel funds, and some are reserved for, for young people um, to go to, to various countries. So uh, you, the question about the university, though, is uh, where's the money going to come from? And some comes from the centre and some, I guess, should come from the college. And uh, I think that's fine probably at the ANU, but maybe it's not fine at other universities in Australia, and I don't know about Japan. Carol Lawson from the ANU College of Law. Um, just a comment for Professor Anderson. I very much enjoyed your um, presentation, and I hate to have to tell you that a couple of years ago when I would walk through the engineering faculty at Nagoya University on my way to work in the College of Law, I would see 100 boys waiting outside the classroom and one girl alone with no one speaking to her and her speaking to no one. So I'm not sure that there's a pipeline of bright young women coming up through the Japanese engineering faculties. Um, but like you, I wish there were. Um, I actually have a question for Professor Aoki. Um, recently, I read an article in the American Chamber of uh, Commerce Journal in Japan, the August uh, publication, <coughs> saying that um, the reason why we don't see women in leadership in Japan is that hiring practices focus on age, gender, and experience, so young, male, and experienced in the field. Um, she suggests that uh, Japan can cope with the shrinking talent pool by changing that hiring practice um, to focus on um, passion and capacity. <coughs> and so look at people who are not male, not young, and not experienced. And succeed. What would be your thoughts and comments on that proposition? Unfortunately, I've never been in a hiring position at a, a commercial uh, organization. I only know the hiring in uh, academic institutions. And it is true that you, you don't, and I've also been, had experience hiring in universities in the United States and New Zealand. And the way you evaluate people are very, very different between Japanese universities and um, US and uh, New Zealand universities. We depend, in Japan, we look at the CV and basically see how many were well, exactly like the commerce uh, article, said, uh, Chamber of Commerce article said. You look at where the person got his degree, but now maybe you stress a lot more on how much the person has published but no weight is given to the reference letter. Well, as in the US and New Zealand, reference letters are very, very important because people realize people are very multidimensional, their talents are dimension multidimensional, and you always stress what, what you think is good about this person, right? And you also implicitly say things that the, the shortcomings of that person, it's not rude, but you get the uh, idea, and I think at least in economics, and I've had a chance to read some uh, recommendation letters in science and engineering when I was engaged in public policy, the idea is the same. Everybody knows how important these reference letters are abroad, and you know how to uh, convey what's important in your field. 
And this practice, unfortunately, in most Japanese universities don't exist uh, yet. And so in short answer to your question about chamber of commerce, I think it's true. The, the way you value people is very, very rigid. And they don't, they're not, people are afraid partly, I think, to uh, step out of the, the traditional way and uh, hire, try somebody new. And by the way, about the uh, percentage of female students, I think national average uh, in engineering schools, the uh, per percentage of female students would be five or seven percent. And the percentage goes, uh, becomes lower as you go up the uh, ladder to assistant professors, associate, and then very few uh, full professors in engineering. That's what's observed. I might just yeah. follow on if I can. So I think that, that problem with the, the diversity and equity, uh, particularly around gender, but also uh, ra racial and ethnicity, uh, follows through to the startup ecosystem. Um, a lot of the, the startup uh, events and, and the, the SME sort of gatherings are dominated by, by men in suits still, uh, or men in t-shirts if it's startups. Um, and, and, but there are um, some interesting initiatives popping up to try and tackle those problems head on. So uh, one that uh, I'm quite close to at the University of New South Wales is called the New Wave. And that's about a platform specifically encouraging female students to try entrepreneurship, um, first in a, a company creation program where uh, females are leading the, the uh, companies. But the more important part, I think, is um, a almost cradling support that we wrap around existing programs open to everyone, where we're, we've set up a virtual board of advisors with experienced uh, female leaders giving uh, the next batch of females going through the, the normal programs a kind of competitive edge. Um, and, and that's had some, some uh, pretty positive results so far. So maybe a, a model like that could be replicated in the classrooms, um, perhaps. Very interesting. Um, there was one other hand here. Yes, OK. Uh, thank you all so much for your fantastic discussion. I actually have two questions. Uh, first one is regarding business processes. So a lot has been said about the language barriers, but a number of companies, Japanese companies, uh, have been uh, really successful in terms of business processes innovations, particularly Uniqlo and Rakuten. They completely uh, introduced English as language that is meant to be used all everywhere in their offices and it has, it has proven to be very successful. So my question in regards to that is do you think other companies should follow this innovation and what are other business, specific business processes um, should be maybe changed in order to foster lower level innovation and entrepreneurship? And second question, should I ask now? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, it hasn't been discussed yet, but I think everyone is thinking about it, is the influence of innovation on labor market, particularly in regards to the question that has been discussed earlier in terms of labor productivity. So a uh, general idea is that innovation will challenge labor market and will cause a lot of unemployment. And however, are the not so much um, like a pessimistic view is that innovation can not so much replace labor but complement labor. So the question is, do you think it is it can actually happen that innovation, uh, well curated innovation, will complement labor and increase labor productivity rather than replace it? And if uh, Japan is actually concerned with the problem of uh, labor replacement due to innovation. Thank you. Great questions, and they could keep us going for quite a long time. We actually only have one minute before I'm going to call on Chiro. So I'm going to ask for a very quick response, and then we might want to follow up afterwards. But 
Um, Rico, is that kind of your, uh, some of it, perhaps your area? Oh, I, I, actually, I heard during coffee breaks people talking about this uh, labor innovation issue. Uh, so I will talk about the English Rakuten and uh, Unicos were very successful. I think partly they've been successful because they've been able to skim the people who can do English and uh, maybe there's some correlation with other skills and being able to in, uh, speak English like they've had, they've studied abroad or something. So English uh, attracts uh, some other kind of talent as well. Although in the long run, your language skills really shouldn't be correlated with your other skills, I don't think, because everybody acquires language, right? So um, in, the sh in the short run, the, the, in, you could, uh, in, sh in the short run, you only would benefit if you're like your Negro or Rakuten that you're the minority doing this. In the long run, I think Japan has to do it. I think the government is now t beginning to teach English at an earlier age because the ordering of these Chinese and Korean students and Japanese students' capability of English has been noted. So in the long run, I think it would happen naturally that more uh, workers speak uh, Japanese Workers speak English, and also there will be more non-Japanese, non-Japanese-speaking workers. Mm. Mm. What about the other? The other part of the question was: What other kinds of business innovations might give companies an edge? Do you have a sense from, you know, looking at competitive companies in, from your lens? Are there other innovations that make a difference? If I knew that, I'd be doing it. <laughs> Maybe like the other panelists would have a better answer, actually. Um, I don't know if this is classified as an innovation, but um, I, I think uh, something as simple as looking at um, the status quo in, related to, uh, in relation to young CEO salaries in Japan, um, that sort of... Uh, a big uh, barrier to, to overcome if, if you're really going to try and encourage young, high potential, um, uh, I, I guess, entrepreneurs to stay in Japan working on startups. Um, that there's definitely not a natural, um, a natural pathway to getting a, a big, attractive CEO salary or VP of uh, whatever section of the company is, as there is in the Silicon Valley. And, and to some extent in Australia. So I think um, doing some work around that, whether it's, it's actually a policy or uh, simply, uh, you know, like, like an equivalent of a Rakuten taking the lead on those kind of things when they're spinning out companies, uh, that, that would be one area I think you could uh, see as a low hanging fruit. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are a whole lot of questions I think that are still in the air and a lot of material in the presentations we've had that I would love to unpack but unfortunately we don't have time and I think at that point it just remains to thank the speakers very much and then call on Shiro to wrap up for us. Maybe after that. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, and look, we're out of time, but let me take this opportunity to make a couple of remarks and, and then some final thank yous before we, we wrap up the 2017 Japan update. Um, just looking back to last year's Japan update, our theme was reinventing Japan. Um, really, Japan from a position of domestic strength and stability and, and strength in leadership. All Japan really had to worry about was the third arrow, structural reforms, and managing a rising China. Um, that has completely changed now. Um, what a difference a year makes. So this year um, has been a whole lot of uncertainty and turbulence, uh, turbulence introduced into the scene. Um, the big shock of the election of Donald Trump um, and Japan managing that and all the uncertainty around the alliance. Uh, as well as the escalation of the North Korean nuclear threat. Uh, and domestically, Prime Minister Abe um, has been shaken by some scandals um, and his LDP was decimated in the, the Tokyo elections in July. Um, so we've tried to cover a few of these issues this year. 
uh, reflect on seeking new directions for Japan. Um, and as our East Asia Forum quarterly says, um, looking at ways for Japan to reposition um, and to challenge, tackle some, some of these really big challenges. Um, so Prime Minister Abe no longer looks invincible and his leadership to 2020 is far from guaranteed. Uh, so perhaps this is time that we might see some more action on economic reform uh, to build political capital. Um, some change might come naturally, almost automatically. Um, we heard from Sekine san uh, the high pressure economy might deliver rising prices, uh, rising wages. Um, that might happen uh, endogenously eventually from labor shortages. Uh, but we've seen labor market institutions persist in Japan. And I think there is a role for significant reform by government. Um, Japan faces, still faces these big structural challenges uh, around the demographics, shrinking and aging of the population, uh, and how Japan tackles these, big, this big challenge and all the, the associated challenges uh, will make a big difference for living standards in Japan. We know that the productivity growth is going to have to do the heavy lifting, and I'm, I'm glad we have a session on innovation at the end today. Um, but as the foreign minister and Aizawa-san talked about, Japan has been a model for the rest of Asia in the, in the post-war period. And if Japan manages to tackle these big challenges, um, Japan will be, again, a model for Northeast Asia uh, and beyond. Um, so look, finally, just on behalf of the Australia-Japan Research Centre and the ANU Japan Institute. Um, I want to thank the audience. You guys um, stayed in, staying the whole day. Um, a long day. It's fruitful, but I realize a lot of you are very busy. Uh, I want to thank very much the speakers who've traveled from, from very far, from Japan and, and elsewhere, but also the, the local speakers who have made time out of their busy schedules. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, the Japan Foundation and the Australia Japan Foundation without whose support this wouldn't happen. And I'm really grateful for the ongoing support. Um, and, and last but not least, uh, Ebony Young and uh, Jill Mulbray Tsumi, who, who really put the whole thing together um, and we're really grateful for professional help. And the whole team was, was really, as usual, um, did, a, did a wonderful job there far too overqualified as, as sub-editors for East Asia Forum running mics, but they did a fantastic job. So um, really grateful to, to them and really grateful to everybody else. Um, we will send a survey around again. We look forward to your feedback. To, to everybody who registered, we'll have a, a survey going to you. Um, we look forward to seeing you next year again from maybe a completely different Japan once again. Uh, and finally, thank you very much.